The presentation will last about 40 minutes and then there will then be an opportunity to ask any questions. The 1st Battalion, the Herefordshire Regiment, had landed at Suvla Bay, Gallipoli on the 8th of August 1915 and 79 fit men were evacuated 127 days later on the 12th of December. During this presentation, I will talk about what happened to the men from Suvla Bay and what happened to the 1st Battalion for the rest of the war. The 79 fit men were evacuated on a single beetle from A Beach, the same beach that they had landed on. They traveled to Lemnos, where they stayed for a few days and then on to Egypt. Their new camp was at Wardan by the Nile north of Cairo. It was a bleak, sandy, windswept, tented site. And the men, exhausted after their time at Suvla Bay, with little equipment and generally only the clothes they stood in, had a fairly miserable Christmas. But already, men that had been evacuated from the peninsula with minor injuries and sickness began to rejoin and the battalion started to reorganize itself. It is worth considering what happened to the other men from the battalion that had been evacuated earlier, almost 900 of them. These men would have entered the medical evacuation chain as shown here. And depending on the severity of their wounds or sickness and their recovery time, they could be returned to duty at any stage as they passed through the system. There was a shortage of medical facilities at Gallipoli especially with the number of casualties as a result of the storm in November. And all means of evacuation were used. Hospital ships, warships and civilian ships. Their destination was irrelevant. It was a matter of getting the individual off the peninsula. As a result, men, often lightly wounded, find them, found themselves in Egypt, Cyprus, Malta, and the United Kingdom. If in Egypt, they would generally pass through a reinforcement unit at the base depot. But if in UK, they would be formed up into a reinforcement draft, often mixing with trained recruits at the depot unit, and then made available for posting. These drafts though, were not always sent to the 1st Battalion and were sometimes sent to units on the Western Front that required reinforcement. The battalion was destined to stay in Egypt as part of the 53rd Welsh Division to counter the Turkish threat. Turkey, or the Ottoman Empire, had entered the war on the side of the Central Powers and as such presented a threat to the Suez Canal and the sea route to the Far East and the jewel in the British Empire's crown, India. There was also an increasing awareness of oil and the oil fields in the Middle East. The Suez Canal is still important, and this has recently been brought to everyone's mind with the giant container ship blocking it. This graph shows the manpower buildup of the battalion in 1916. This involved a massive administrative and logistic effort, issuing new uniforms, training, and absorbing the reinforcements and re-establishing a viable chain of command. Men rejoined from hospitals in Egypt and the first draft of new men from UK arrived in March and the first draft of returned Suvla men from the UK in May. By September, the battalion was pretty much up to full strength. Many men were detached on courses as part of the battalion reconstitution. However, as well as receiving manpower, the battalion also lost manpower. I've already mentioned those lost to reinforcement drafts to other units, but pre-war territorials had their terms of engagements honored and many were discharged in early 1916. 
Quite a few then re-enlisted after their terminal leave period. The opportunity for four weeks leave in the UK was just too much of an attraction. Tradesmen, for example, farriers, engineers, wagoners, were lost to the battalion as they could be of better use within the army in that specialized role. This also normally meant more pay than the infantry as well. There were also new units being formed, the Machine Gun Corps, the Royal Flying Corps, and the Imperial Camel Corps. And men seeking some adventure or just fed up with foot slogging, volunteered or were transferred. This was a busy but relatively easy time for the battalion with the unit and individuals needing to build up their strength and many took advantage of sightseeing expeditions. For many, this was their first time overseas and they could see things they had only read about and learned about at school and the pyramids proved a particular attraction. In March, 1916, the battalion moved from Wardan to Wadi Natrun in the Western Desert. This was to counter a perceived threat from the Senussi Arabs in Libya to Western Egypt. This was part of a possible Islamic Jihad, a holy war whipped up by the Muslim Ottoman Empire. If you are familiar with John Buchan's book, Green Mantle, you will know about this. That's the John Buchan that also wrote the 39 steps. The men hated Wadi Natrun. It was a dreadful place, a dry, hot Wadi with soda and salt mines and factories and little else. The battalion was pleased to move away from Wadi Natrun and in July, they moved to northeastern Egypt in the region of Romani, close to the Mediterranean coast, bordering the Sinai, and this to counter a Turkish threat. The battalion occupied sandbagged outposts in the desert. This was their first experience of digging trenches in the sand, which proved difficult, and all trenches needed to be revetted with sandbags. These pictures are of number six outpost, which was the forward post manned by Captain Ernest Capal and 175 men. They bore the brunt of the Turkish assault on the 23rd of July, which started with over 60 bombs dropped by Turkish aircraft, followed by an intense artillery barrage Fortunately, much of the effect was absorbed by the soft sand, but even so, they suffered 16 fatalities and many wounded. As a result of this action, Captain Capel was awarded the Military Cross. His citation reads, for conspicuous gallantry in action, he held his post against the enemy and under intense fire, displayed great courage and determination. Later, he rendered great assistance observing for the British artillery. This Turkish venture never really developed into a full-blown assault. An immediate British counterattack was launched and over 2,000 prisoners taken. And it was the last Turkish assault against Egypt. And it signaled for the allies to prepare their advance across the Sinai Peninsula and take the war to the Turks. After Romani, the battalion moved to Al Ferdam, a camp on the banks of the Suez Canal, described as nothing but a ferry and a, and a swing bridge. It was the world's largest swing bridge, a rail bridge opening in the center and swinging to both banks. Here they settled down to a routine of canal guards and training and enjoyed bathing in the canal and sightseeing. Again, this was a relatively quiet time with sports, rest and sightseeing as well as training. One veteran told me of swimming in the canal and watching the liners transiting the canal with lights blazing, music playing and dancing on the decks. He remembered scrounging cigarettes from the passengers, mainly Americans, 
who threw them tins of smokes. He also mentioned to me one curious duty which they had, which was to keep the track swept. A strip of sand parallel to the canal was swept with branches each evening and inspected each morning to detect signs of movement. This picture shows the sergeant's mess at that time. Also in England, a welfare fund was set up by the families and the local great and good and welfare parcels were sent out to the battalion. These included sports items, writing paper and the inevitable cigarettes and tobacco. Then in late 1916, the advance across the Sinai began. The force was reorganized and the Herefords were put in the desert column. The advance was slow and deliberate with a railway and a water pipeline being built behind to advance those troops, to, to supply the advancing troops. By early spring, the advance had reached Rafa and the first assault against the Turks in the Gaza Strip could take place. This would open up the coastal route to Palestine. The troops were pleased to have crossed the Bear Sinai Desert and one officer recorded, the area across the border was delightful country, cultivated to perfection and the crops looked quite good, if not better than most English farms, chiefly barley and wheat. The villages were very pretty, a mass of orange, fig and other fruit trees. The relief of seeing such country after the miles and miles of bare sand and for the first time in months, we marched on the grass. These were the days of Lawrence of Arabia and the Imperial Camel Corps sweeping across the open southeastern flanks. However, the Turks knew an assault was coming and had prepared significant defenses with trenches and redoubts covering the bare open ground. On the 26th of March, the first Battle of Gaza took place. The 53rd Division made a direct assault from the south, with the Herefords assaulting in the area of Ali Munter. Their advance started in thick mist. In some cases, visibility was down to 20 metres. There was some initial success, but eventually the whole advance faltered and a Turkish counterattack caused the units to retire to their pre-battle locations where they consolidated the sandbagged trench line. Judging by Western Front standards, the losses were light. The Herefords suffered 13 killed, including Lieutenant Alec Wilson and Private John Hope, shown here. 181 wounded and 24 missing. Some of those missing would end up as prisoners of war of the Turks and those prisoners of war had a pretty rough time. A further assault was made in the middle of April. This time the 53rd Division were the left-hand formation up against the sea, assaulting the area about Al Arish. Again, it was unsuccessful. The Turks had reinforced and the attacking troops came under effective long range machine gun fire. The Herefords were ordered to forward to Occupy Ridge to be known as Hereford Ridge. Eventually the assault was halted and the position consolidated. Tanks had been used for the first time in the Middle East, but only one per each brigade. And a hazard of tank involvement was found when they churned up the comms cables, which had been laid to coordinate the artillery support. Herefordshire fatalities were 17, including Company Sergeant Major Edward Morris, shown here. Troop morale was not good. As one officer said, the long spell without leave, the bitterness of two defeats, heat, flies, scorpions, all played havoc with liver and temper. 
the fleas from nearby villages added a somewhat unlooked for burden to the discomfort. At this point, General Murray was recalled, a polite term for sacked, and replaced, replaced by General Sir Edmund Allenby. Allenby had had not a good war on the Western Front, but was to make his name in the Middle East. He was a little like Montgomery in the Second World War. He introduced an intensive training regime and insisted on having more troops allocated. He would not launch an assault until his force was totally prepared. He visited the troops, giving morale boosting addresses, and gradually the morale and the efficiency of the force improved considerably. One man recalled, oh, those days of divisional and brigade training, with early starts, <coughs> ghastly greasy breakfasts, hurriedly pushed down in heat and glare. A great relaxation was a trip to the sea, with a glorious bathe at the end of it. Canteens were well stocked, concert parties were started, and leave to Cairo was plentiful. August, September and October were devoted to training of the hardest type. Dummy trenches were made and everything possible was done to obtain the right conditions of fitness, including, as shown here on the left, feet inspections. Everyone knew, even back in Alexandria and Cairo, that a general attack was being prepared, but this time very few knew the date. The Third Battle of Gaza was to take place in November. <clears throat> Allenby had ensured his troops were well prepared, and this time there would be a flanking movement about Beersheba to outflank the Gaza defences. 53 Division were to be part of that flanking force, and the Herifords were to assault and hold the high ground inland and dominating the coastal strip and the town of Gaza. Their objective was Kuelfi, which was to become a well-known name in the battalion's history. The battalion pushed on and reached the reverse slopes of Kuelfi Hill, shooting and bayoneting many Turks on the way. They also overran nine Turkish artillery pieces and the transport of a machine gun company. However, driving mist descended making it impossible to, to distinguish friend from foe at more than a few hundred yards. And unfortunately, in the confusion of battle, the British artillery barrage opened up again and compo compelled the Herifords to abandon their captured guns. The battle was ultimately successful and the Turks were beaten, opening up the coastal strip. The Herifords dug in on the hillside at Kuelfi, and the remains of their trenches can still be seen in the foreground of this picture. Eleven men were killed and over 110 wounded, and 10 men were missing. It was during this battle that Captain Fox Russell of the Royal Army Medical Corps was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. He was a medical officer of the first six Royal War Fusiliers, but was attached to the Herefordshire Regiment. His citation reads, on the 6th of November, 1917, at Kuelfi, Palestine, Captain Fox Russell repeatedly went out to attend to the wounded and a murderous fire from snipers and machine guns. In many cases where no other means were at hand, he carried casualties in himself, although almost exhausted. He was later fatally wounded. On the 25th of November, the battalion moved to Beersheba. All the native inhabitants had deserted the place under the Turkish regime and the many roofless houses gave it the appearance of having been shelled. But the Turks had taken the roofs as they were so short of timber. The men were billeted in the bazaar-like shops and seemed glad to be under some sort of cover again, dirty though it was. 
The battalion also bivouacked near Bethlehem, and the men recognized many of the names of the towns, hills, lakes, and rivers from their school religious education lessons. As one said, Hebron proved to be most beautiful, a city of gardens with the square tomb of Abraham in the middle. We went to Bethlehem and got our first view of Jerusalem, a mile or two further on, where we could see heavy fighting on the Mount of Olives. They also thought the Middle East should be warm and dry, but it rained heavily and marches were wet with little opportunity to dry out properly at the end of the day. This was a miserable time. The weather was wet and cold and the troops suffered much hardship. On Christmas day, it blew a gale with heavy rain and the whole country became waterlogged. Lieutenant W.F. Bushell was a schoolmaster and wrote in his school magazine sometime after the war of his experiences. Some masters joined the forces immediately. Ultimately, I got away to play my part and joined the Herefordshire Regiment. In all, I was away from the school for four terms, but spent most of this abroad, some nine months in Palestine and six months in France. I have in mind, too, the hardships involved, and I shall never forget the Palestine winter in the hills, with continual rainfall and lack of any shelter. Even dugouts gave no sort of shelter. We built sangas of stone and stone wall barriers had to be used. Trenches could not be dug in the stony soil. I remember snow on Christmas day at Bethlehem. It was difficult to believe that shepherds were in those fields outside Bethlehem 19 centuries earlier. At Christmas 1917, General Allenby liberated Jerusalem and entered the city on foot as a liberator rather than a victor. The holy Christian city had been freed from Muslim rule. One amusing story is that all British troops were ordered not to enter the city until General Allenby had formally liberated it. The story is that a cook sergeant of the Herefords was on the scrounge and went into the city the night before. A good story, and who knows, perhaps that Hereford sergeant was the real liberator of Jerusalem. The advance north continued in 1918. The weather remained poor, and the advance was slow, as there were generally few roads capable of carrying weird vehicles. The majority of local transport being donkey, the battalion provided fatigue parties every day for road building duties, a task which they disliked with a vengeance. Their advance was on the Jericho Road, the very road travelled in the Bible by the Good Samaritan. When vet one veteran told me of this miserable time and recalled at one stage a group of soldiers were ordered to heat up their entrenching tools and press uniforms. He never knew why, whether it was for an inspection that didn't take place or to kill the lice. And 70 years later, it was still a mystery to him. During this period, Lieutenant Colonel Drake, who had been in command since August 1914, left the battalion and Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence took over. The advance continued to the Judean Hills there were times of beauty amongst the harsh landscape and glimpses of the Dead Sea in the distance, as can be seen in this watercolour painting by a member of the Worcester Yeomanry. The local names of hills were generally unpronounceable and were renamed in familiar terms. Hills were named after the old commanding officer and the adjutant, Drake Hill and Chip Hill. Engagements continued as the Turks were pushed northwards and casualties continued. It was at this time that a reorganization of Middle East forces took place. A battalion in each brigade was to be replaced by an Indian battalion and the British battalion was to move to the Western Front. 
the Herefordshire Regiment was selected to be the battalion lost to 158 Brigade. The battalion was sad to leave the formation it had been part of for three and a half years, and the officers of the brigade presented a silver figure to the Hereford's officers in recognition of this association. I will let Sergeant Colley describe what happened next. After we had withdrawn from the line, we were informed by the brigadier that we had been chosen to leave for France. We commenced on a six day march from the line to the railhead and were inspected by the GOC, who wished us the best of luck and success upon our arrival in France. We rested for a few days and then in train for Kantara, no one being sorry to leave Palestine and the Sinai Desert behind. Upon arrival at Kantara, we found about 300 of our men waiting to rejoin. All these men being returned from hospitals, convalescent camps, depots, and also some from a base draft. We were equipped, refitted, and eventually in train for the port of Alexandria, embarking on board the ship, the Kaiser Ehind, straight from the train. We bade goodbye to Egypt on the 17th of June and sailed to Taranto the southern Italian port. We sailed in a convoy of five ships, escorted by submarine chasers, Japanese torpedo boats and destroyers and several aeroplanes. It was quite a sight to see the boats zigzag and keep perfect formation. Submarines had been very active in this area and a great strain was felt by everyone on nearing Italy. One torpedo was fired at us but luckily missed, and we disembarked at Taranto on the 22nd of June, after a rather nice sea voyage. A day was spent here, during which time everyone drank an enormous quantity of beer. Then we commenced an eight day train journey. We were loaded in vans, as many as 35 and 40 men being crowded into one van, together with all our equipment. It can be, can be imagined that we did not travel in comfort. Many sighed for the joys of a Pullman car. In spite of all of this, the journey was really enjoyable. It was nice to see the hedges and green trees once again. The country was simply marvelous. Hot meals were provided en route. We passed through Angora and Genoa, Marseille was the loveliest part of the journey, passing right through the Riviera, Nice, Monaco, Cannes and Monte Carlo. Flags were flying everywhere and we felt quite pleased. Passing through Italy, many were the cause for bully beef from the inhabitants offering large bottles of their native wine in exchange. The battalion joined 102 Brigade, part of the 34th Division, with the 1st, 4th and the 1st, 7th Cheshire Regiments. 34 Division had ceased to exist after the Third Battle of Ypres, and it had been reduced to a carder. It was now being rebuilt and a period of consolidation and training planned. The divisional shoulder flash was a checkerboard as shown here. The division was concentrating in the Bambeck area in northern France. However, the training was suddenly stopped and the troops entrained on the 16th of July at a few hours notice for an unknown destination. This proved to be the Soissons area where the division concentrated and came under command of 30 Corps of the 10th French Army commanded by General Mangin. The reason for this was that the Allies had started their advance and were attacking at many points to keep pressure on the Germans. The French had attacked in the Soissons area and driven the enemy back some five miles, taking many prisoners and guns. 34 Division was to take part in the exploitation of this victory. On the 21st, orders were received to take over part of the front line the next day. <coughs> 
But before this could happen, orders were changed and orders were received to take part in an attack early on the following day, the 23rd of July. The brigade commander wrote later, even in ideal circumstances, this would have been a severe challenge. But for a newly constituted division, composed as regards infantry of troops which had not operated together, not yet been in action in France, and which had just completed a trying move by rail, bus and route march, it was a very severe test. There was also no, no time for recce. The country was entirely new. There were no organized trench systems on either side and the enemy positions were never accurately known until they had been captured. And in addition to this, this was the first time the division had operated with and been under command of the French. The brigade got off in time and the first 7th Cheshire's and the Hereford advanced through high standing corn, which made control difficult. Enemy machine gun fire was heavy <coughs> and effective and there were many casualties, but they got forward some 1200 yards. They were stopped here by the weight and intensity of the machine gun fire and they dug in pending the advance of troops on their flanks, which did not occur. The line was then consolidated and a defensive flank thrown out. This is the Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery at Rappery, where many of the Herifords killed that day lie. The rising stubble field behind was the cornfield they advanced through with machine gun fire coming from the woods to the right. The losses in this operation were considerable. 35 men killed and eight officers and 230 other ranks wounded, including Major Whitehouse and many others that had served at Suvla Bay. Major Whitehouse was killed by a German machine gun post which opened up from his rear after it had not been seen and cleared by the advancing troops. The battalion then returned to Flanders and were in the area of Mount Kemmel to the south of Ypres. By this time, the front was moving and the Germans were being driven back. The momentum of the attack needed to be maintained and emphasis was placed on low level commanders initiative to maintain the pressure. The Herefords bounced forward and took part in the assault across the River Lees. Casualties continued to mount, but this was secondary to maintaining the advance. As Sergeant Colley said, the battalion was now continuously in action and right through September, we were continuously in the front passing through Gulevelt and Menin, being the first English troops to pass through these places. Amongst the casualties was Arthur Richards, who had enlisted with his brother George in August 1914 and fought at Suvla Bay and the Middle East. Arthur was killed in action and George was to be awarded the military medal. On the 11th of November, 1918, the battalion was out of the line and a one-liner in the war diary records, company training, hostilities ceased at 1100. And the men began to look forward to a future and a return home. But first they were destined to be part of the army of occupation in the Rhineland and they marched eastwards. Discharges started quickly and the battalion strength reduced. This slide does not include all discharges, but gives an idea of the profile of discharges. The battalion reduced to a carder and returned to the UK with the regimental colors, which had been deposited in Hereford Cathedral for safekeeping in August, 1914 and brought out to Germany after hostilities ceased. 
The colours were returned to Hereford in May 1919, which signalled the end of the regiment's wartime service. The 1st Battalion had suffered 371 fatalities, as well as hundreds wounded, and the spread of these deaths can be shown here. You can see the peaks of 1915, which was Suvla Bay, and then the individual peaks of Romani and the first, second, and third battles of Gaza. And then in late 1918, the constant attrition of the warfare on the Western Front. The battalion was also awarded nine distinguished service orders, 24 military crosses, nine distinguished conduct medals, 43 military medals, and four meritorious service medals, as well as many mentions in dispatches and foreign awards. That is the end of the presentation, and I hope that you have enjoyed it and seen and uh, um, better understand now what the battalion, the 1st Battalion of the Hereford Regiment did after its evacuation from Suvla Bay. Uh, I'm now quite happy to take any questions as long as we can get the technology to work so that uh, I can hear those questions. I, can I ask a question? I, can I be heard? I can hear you, Danny. I can hear you, Danny. Uh, Hopefully we, we can relay these messages over. Unfortunately, due to a technical issue, we're having to relay these messages via laptop and a phone. So there should be some, might be some delay. So if we could just uh, do one at a time, we should be all right there. So first, first hand up, fire away. Oh. <laughs> um, I, 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 can you hear me? I can't. I can't put my. Ha I got my hand up, but I can't see myself. Yeah, I can. I can hear you, yeah. Bill. Hello, Andy. It's, yeah, it's Bill here. And um, I'm very interested in the the transfer of power in um, when they left. Um, you, you mentioned an Indian regiment came in. In was it Palestine or was it in um, uh, in well. <laughs> wherever it was. Yes, it was. It was, it, it was in Palestine in, in 19, uh, in, in July 1918. 1918. The, each brigade lost one English battalion and they were replaced by Indian troops. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued that my grandfather who was with the Worcester Regiment and was also, um, uh, involved, the Worcesters were involved down there. there. There's a sudden gap in his uh, career and he suddenly ends up in, uh, in late 1919 in India and in the Indian Army. Um, any kind of, I, I'm sorry, but this isn't, it isn't the KSLI, <laughs> but any, any thoughts on why that should be? What, why, what were the Indian Army doing there and so on, what was uh, that link? I, I would think the, the probability is that he volunteered to, um, to or signed back on. Right. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and okay. I, would, I would say an absolutely wonderful, a wonderful presentation, despite the technicalities, a wonderful <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Uh, Andy, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, James. Um, I think one of the photographs you showed was of Chip when he was adjutant. I think he was he actually commanded the battalion on four or five separate occasions. Can you enlarge on on the Chip career in in, in uh, during that period? Yeah, Ch Chip was was quite a character, the most decorated soldier from the uh, the Herefordshire Regiment in the First World War. Um, he was commissioned on the beaches of Gallipoli and uh, he, various times he served 
on the brigade staff. He served as adjutant, as a company commander and battalion second in command. And in the, on the Western Front, uh, when they went there in July, 1918, the commanding officers on several occasions were wounded. And on each of those occasions, Chip took over as the commanding officer. And he took over as commanding officer four times for various periods uh, of, um, of weeks and, and up to a, a month on one occasion. And during that time as well, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order and a bar to the Distinguished Order. He was mentioned in dispatches and he was awarded the Croix de Guerre by Belgium and by France to add to the military cross that he'd won in the uh, Middle East. Or interest is Metal Group has now in the uh, been uploaded to the talk chat so you can open that up and have a look at his uh, fantastic selection of uh, medals and awards. I think the story of his medals in, in Singapore is worth, worth a mention, Andy, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, after the, uh, the First World War, Chip went out to work in Malaya and he was captured by the Japanese when they um, invaded Singapore. But he had hidden his medals uh, before the Japanese arrived, he was then taken prisoner of war and interned. Uh, when he was released, he actually went and recovered his medals uh, from the place that uh, where where he'd hidden them. I, I think if I can add to that, I I think that uh, what happened was that he he put them in the mouth of a crocodile in the museum. Um, because he was told that the Japanese didn't, didn't uh, particularly like crocodiles. And, and when he went back after he'd been let out from Changi, they were still there. Yep. Yes, that's right. Any more questions at all? Well, could I just say thank, thank you all then for, for joining us this evening. And again, my apologies for the slight technical issue, uh, but the gremlins managed to get into the system again. And I promise I'll, I'll try harder next time. But thank you all very much. And, um, and good night all. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andy. Good night. Thank you. Thank, good you. Night. thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Andy. Good night. Most enjoyable.